Hi, and welcome to the exclusive monthly video for Patrons Plus and Channel Members Plus, who support the channel. First, before we get into it, I want to say a big thank you for your support of my work and to keep the channel going. I really appreciate it. Today, we're going to look into a really interesting topic. A creature known as the Wodowos, the Woodwos, or the Wild Men of the Woods, which has been featured in artworks from all across Europe, especially in medieval times. Let's get started. Across Europe, belief in wild folk that lived in the forests was commonplace. And in some places, there were folk who lived in the forest and were viewed as savages, though usually they were just people with different cultures and beliefs and languages, which would have made it hard to communicate. The wild men that we're going to look at today, however, were something different. The wild man has been included in countless classic artworks and texts from numerous countries and in various languages. The creature is typically known as simply the Wild Man, but it goes by a number of different names across Europe, most of which translate into English as Wild Man. The longer Wild Man of the Woods is also used, as well as the Old English words the Woodwoes or the Wodowoes. Often, if a crop failed to prosper, it was sometimes blamed on the wild men, trampling through the field and gnawing on the plants at night. Depictions of the wild men are quite similar and the same, though they do vary somewhat from place to place across Europe. Most depictions or descriptions describe a lone male spotted out in the woods. But there are plenty of artworks that include both female and male wild men, or wild folk, I suppose. In some earlier depictions, they were shown to be much bigger than humans, almost like giants, or even double the size of a human. However, in later artworks, they're shown to be about the size of a normal man. Some say that they have the ability to change their size at will. They're usually shown to be humanoids, with hair covering almost their whole body. Sometimes their feet, knees, elbows and hands are bare, as well as their face. Except for the males that, of course, have long and scraggly beards, which often blend in with the rest of the hair on their body and the long hair on their heads. The females have a similar hair pattern, although no beards, and interestingly, their breasts are often bare as well, especially in medieval artworks. As the name suggests, the wild men and women are said to be almost human, but not quite. They're often aggressive, unable to control their emotions, and savage, living like animals in the forest, and typically walking on all fours, rather than upright. It's most common for stories to tell of a single male wild man that was spotted or reported. However, some say that they may live in small family-like groups in the woods, often in caves and rocky crevices, hollow trees or crude shelters made of sticks and mud. Timothy Husband's book, The Wild Man, focuses on artistic representations of these creatures throughout history, primarily in the medieval period when they were most popular. He goes into great detail describing the wild man's behaviour. By every account, the wild man's behaviour matched his primitive surroundings. Strong enough to uproot trees, he was violent and aggressive, not only against wild animals, but also against his own kind. 
his brutish, contentious nature expressed itself in natural combativeness against which neither beast nor man was equal, though his club and sometimes only his bare hands were his only weapon. With his instinctive knowledge of the ways of wild beasts, the wild man was a skilled hunter. But in spite of his physical supremacy, he shrank from contact with humans, and frequently even with his own kind. Indeed, his inept social abilities apparently limited him to only that cooperative union required for procreation. It was widely believed that the wild man was more animal than human, and he only had the ability for very limited speech, if any at all. He couldn't control himself in the way that proper human men could, and if he became angry he would get aggressive and take his frustration out on trees, pulling them up by the roots. The wild man was unable to control his anger, and also unable to control his desires, around human women, and even females of his own kind. Despite his great strength, aggression, and potential to do harm, the wild man was thought to be timid and shy, perhaps even scared of humans, doing his best to stay away from them and stick to the densest parts of the woods. Another thing that set the wild man apart from the human man was their stature in that they walked on all fours, crawling around the woods, whereas a human man of course walked upright. This was especially noticeable when it came to the wild man's eating habits and his diet. It was common for them to rummage around and scratch in the dirt, looking for roots and wild tubers to eat. They would pull up roots, pick berries and leaves, and eat them raw. But they were far from vegetarian. As Timothy Husband described just a bit earlier, they were proficient hunters, and when they captured game, big and small, they were known to prepare it very little, the only preparation being to cut or rip open the animal's carcass and to eat the flesh and organs raw. During this hunt and other combat, the wild man was commonly believed to favour a wooden club that he'd fashioned himself out of a crude stick or log. But he was more than proficient with it in his savagery. Husband also made note that it was widely believed that the wild men partook in cannibalism, eating both wild and civilized men alike. Though it would be debated whether or not a wild man eating a human man would be considered cannibalism depending on your view of what exactly the wild man is. Legends tell that the wild men of the woods would abduct women and children, in some cases as food, but some stories tell of children being taken away and adopted by the creatures and cared for to fulfill their paternal instincts. Others tell that women were kidnapped of course, for intimate purposes, and some say that the wild men may even fall in love with a woman after watching her for some time from a distance, and then stealing her away in the night, usually, of course, without her prior knowledge or consent. These legends were commonly used to scare children into behaving, and the wild man acted as a type of boogeyman in many places. Medieval artworks may give us an idea of why the wild man was shy or timid when it came to approaching humans. This is because in many artworks they're depicted as being hunted by human hunting parties. Being chased through the woods 
by dogs and mounted riders who were on the hunt, not for food, but for fun. The wild men were viewed as no more than any other animal and were thought to provide good sport for any hunting party. This was, in part, believed because the wild men did not believe in God. Nay, they were not believed to have the capability to perceive the meaning of the word God. Throughout medieval Europe, Husband describes this as, although the wild men could hardly be suspected of overweening faith, Medieval authors stressed not that the wild man was without belief in God, but that he was utterly without knowledge of him. This absence of a belief in God set the wild man apart from modern man, putting him into the category of animal rather than human. Within artworks, it was incredibly common for the wild man to appear alongside other mythical and magical beasts. Unicorns, dragons, chimeras, and all manner of wonderful creatures. They were often shown hunting them, tending to them, riding them, and just next to them in the artworks. These depictions can be found in paintings, coats of arms, and family crests, as decals on manuscripts tapestries, gargoyles on buildings and statues, and even everyday objects such as candle holders, cups, and beakers. But where did the idea of the wild man come from? Timothy Husband describes many writings written by ancient Greek historians and authors that document the wild men that were thought to live in Africa and Asia, and less civilized parts of the world, at least according to the authors. These writings tell of wild men like creatures that live in the wilderness. It has been a common belief throughout time, perhaps since the ancient Greeks or even before, and well into even the most recent centuries, that places such as Africa and Asia were exotic, foreign, and full of dangerous and mysterious beasts, the wild men being just one. Husband describes this, that in the earliest Greek literature, Races of aberrational human forms were reported to live in India, Ethiopia, Libya, and other remote lands. Over the centuries, natural histories, cosmologies, chronicles, and encyclopedias continued the tradition in accounts referred to generically as the Marvels of the East. One of the first to mention these creatures, the wild men, was Herodotus in his Historia of the 5th century BC. The Greek historian describes many species in detail, in addition to huge snakes, elephants, bears, horned asses, and other beasts. He states that there dwelled in Libya the dog-headed men, and the headless that had their eyes on their breasts, as the Libyans say, and the wild men and women, besides many other creatures not fabulous. Thus, in the earliest literature, wild men were numbered among the monstrous races. It's believed that the medieval wild men may have been influenced by some pagan or pre-Christian ideas from across Europe of the mythical or magical beings that lived in the forest, especially when we look at how the wild man is often juxtapositioned against the good Christian medieval man. Whatever the case and wherever the wild men and women of the woods come from, without a doubt they play an interesting role within the monstrous and mythical creatures that were believed in during medieval times.
giving almost a bridge between monsters and men, being something just in between, on the edge where man and monster meets. That was today's video on the Wild Man, or the Wodowos, from across European folklore and legends, especially, of course, from medieval times. I hope you enjoyed it. Once again, I want to give a big thank you for supporting my work and the channel. And, as always, I'll see you in the next video. Bye!